Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Alexei, and today I have a special guest, Yal Lavi. Yal is an American guitar player and sound engineer. Also, he's a co-founder of Unstoppable Recording Machine, the best online community on recording, mixing, and mastering metal music. And he's a co-founder of Riff Heart, an online school for metal guitar players. Also, Yal is a founding member of metal band Da Us. It's a huge honor to have you on my YouTube channel today, Yao. And let's start our interview. How you, Joel and Joey, founded Unstoppable Recording Machine Company. In 2013, I started making instructional videos as a favor to my really, really close friend, Finn McKenty, because he had just started the audio over there. And uh, I helped him put together the plans for it that he was pitching to, you know, the bosses at Creative Law. And I also was pretty much the only producer he knew. So I was the person to do the audio classes. And uh, I was not really planning on doing that as a, you know, as a career or anything. It was really just a favor to a close friend. But... The first class I did, which was, um, it was a course for Easy Drummer, which at the time, in 2013, I hadn't even ever used before. I learned how to use it for the course, and uh, the course went great. It, much to my surprise, I had a great time doing it. I thought it was going to be embarrassing. I thought I was going to hate it, but I loved it. And people loved it, and so then I just started doing more of them, and I also started introducing Finn to my network of friends that are great producers and the creative live audio channel started to grow and uh, i ended up doing about eight more creative lives and what was happening was that my creative lives were doing just as well if not better than a lot of the much more famous producers and so that to me was a hint or a clue at least that maybe I should look into this path. So I actually asked Finn if Creative Live would hire me and I could move to Seattle and work with him on the audio channel, make it great. And uh, he said, no, he said, they're not going to hire you and you're going to hate it. So I told him I'm going to do it by myself, uh, if not. And so I decided I'm going to start this online audio school by myself and do, do it right. And then I saw this post by a guy named Joey Sturges that I, I didn't really know him. I mean, I knew who he was, but we didn't know each other. But I saw him post that he wanted to start an audio school online too. And I, that gave me a little bit of a panic uh, because he, he was kind of at the peak of his popularity at that point in time. He had just released uh, Gain Reduction, I believe. And, uh, you know, he's a very smart, very, he's a very smart guy. And if he wanted to do that, he could have totally done it. And I didn't want to be competing with him. So I figured, why not try to join up with him? So I just hit him up and I said, hey, look, you're doing this. I'm going to do it. We should at least meet and talk. So he flew down to where I lived. We had a meeting and just decided to do it. And then he told me, uh, I know this guy named Joel. Uh, he's really good at talking. He should be on our podcast. And uh, <laughs> he brought on Joel and Joel is really good at talking. And basically that's uh, one thing led to another. It started as a podcast. Well, m with them, it started as a podcast. I had already been doing stuff in person, like these in-person boot camps in 2014, where I would host like four days straight at a studio, have an artist there and sell tickets. And then like 10 people would come in from all over the world and watch the entire process start to finish in person. So I was already doing that under URM. But the URM with Joey and Joel parallel to that started as a podcast with the idea that we were then going to evolve it into more, but the podcast was how we would begin. But, uh, you know, I had the idea for nail the mix already. I just didn't feel like it was the time. So we let the podcast kind of grow. We established ourselves a little. And then at the end of 2015, we launched nail the mix and it took off immediately. And the rest, as they say, is history. So my next question is, what is the main purpose of creating URM as an educational platform? Well, there's many purposes, but the main purpose was, you know, like we said, to create the next generation of audio professionals. But if you go a little bit deeper, my personal reasons 
were because, you know, I come from a classical background and I went to school for it and I studied it. Uh, I have fine artists in my family. I've been around, uh, I guess what you would call fine art and orchestral music my whole life. And I've been in university systems. And I know that the only genre back then that they never paid any attention to of major genres was metal. You could go and you could learn anything else, but metal was just kind of, in, especially in recording schools. And so it seemed to me like around the years of 2010 and on, I was noticing this trend of producers getting less and less full album work. They were getting more just do the drums and do the mix. Uh, the band will record themselves They'll re on the rest. They'll record the guitars themselves, the vocals themselves. More and more bands were starting to self-produce. And I was realizing, okay, this is, this is a trend that cannot be stopped. You know, it's like a tsunami coming at you. You can't stop the evolution of technology. And it was super clear just from working in studios and paying attention that Technology was going to evolve to a point where more and more people were going to be doing it on their own because the barrier to entry was getting lower. And that would mean that if nobody helped them, that the overall level of metal recordings was just going to start to drop because you would just, you'd have the market flooded by people that didn't know what they were doing. And then nobody was capturing the knowledge of all the great metal producers who helped get the genre to where it was. Every other genre, you could go to university, you could get a degree and, uh, and learn, you know, learn how to play jazz, learn how to record pop, et cetera. But metal, which is super, super specific, had nothing. Like there was nothing out there. You had like the Andy Sneet forums where every once in a while he would drop a hint, but there was nothing real or documented on the art and the science of metal production. So I just figured, someone has to do it it's going to be me and uh it makes sense because it's my world between me and joey and joel we know almost everybody i have experience already with creative live it uh it, i can do this and if i don't do this it might never happen and then what's going to happen with all that knowledge so it's just going to disappear uh i that was a legitimate concern of mine because if you think about it, recording studios were starting to close at that time. There were less and less opportunities for people to learn from the great producers in person. It, something had to be done. So I just decided that it was going to be me and us that did it. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's the big picture of why. How URM can help people become better at mixing metal. The reason that we are very, very helpful for people who want to learn how to actually produce and mix metal is because of a few different things. Number one, the people teaching the courses or nail the mix or just the various different things that we do are the people who have done it in real life, who have made the records that people love and that people listen to. So this is not, you know, this is not somebody teaching you how somebody else did it. This is the information straight from the source. And there's nothing more valuable. Like everybody says that a mentorship is the best way to learn, right? But you're not going to get a mentorship. Everybody can't get a mentorship with the best producers. Like they're, the math doesn't work. So this is the next best thing. So you're getting the information right from the people who did it in real life. You're getting multi-tracks of the actual bands. That's another thing. With a lot of online education, it's very abstract in that you watch somebody do something on a screen and then that's it. You kind of have to guess how it applies on your end, but we give you the materials and the materials are really cool. You know, it's like, if we say you're going to learn how to mix Meshuggah, you're going to get actual Meshuggah tracks. And then that way, when you're watching the videos on how to do it, you can apply them to the exact same thing that the instructor is doing. And uh, it's not abstract, it's very real life. And beyond that, we have an incredible community of people that actually support each other 
help each other. And that community is also populated by the instructors. So, you know, in any given scenario, you could have a, a post in our community asking for help on something and someone like Nolly will just jump in and start helping people. I don't really know where else you get the combination of all those things. And also, in addition, we have, in my opinion, and lots of people's opinions, the very best, most in-depth uh, courses on the subject. When I say we go deep, we go seriously deep. And the thing that's different between us and say, if you were to just go get a Pro Tools certification, is that most recording education is very generalized. You know, and it's good to have a good general knowledge of signal flow and things like that. But if you want to drill down specifically on what's important for this sound or aggressive sounds, because it does uh, it does translate over to other genres as well. But if you want to know the specifics of what you actually need to use, you know, that's that makes a huge difference to be taught that as opposed to a Pro Tools certification where you will basically be taught every single function that Pro Tools does. Like, you're not going to get taught what you should get better at within Pro Tools. There's a million different things you can do with it or any DAW. You, you can do a million different things with any of the popular DAWs. So it's important to know which things to do, you know, which things matter. You know, they say that a great mix is the sum of a thousand little decisions. Well, out of those thousand little decisions, you know, there's a million decisions that could be made. So what are the thousand decisions that are right? And we focus on that rather than the million decisions that will lead you down the wrong path. Do you teach people how to mix metal according to some commercial music standards? Or how does it work? Well, commercial music standards, uh, I don't know if you mean like in mastering, you mean the like Apple Music standards or mastering for vinyl. Uh, if you mean that kind of stuff, yes, we do have courses that cover those very technical specifics. But as far as what the commercial standard is artistically, well, it, it varies. It definitely varies, but I would like to think that we teach people where the bar is at for competitive quality. And by competitive, I don't mean a sports competition. I just mean that when you hear your work next to, you know, some famous band's work by some great mixer, that it doesn't make you super sad <laughs> and want to quit, that you can actually hold your own with your work. That's the goal. And so we try to teach people how to get to that. But what's commercially successful? I mean, that's always changing. And it, it's subjective what you mean by commercial. Like, is commercial Demu Borgir for black metal? Okay, maybe. But uh, it's not commercial compared to Nickelback for, you know, pop rock, it, it's not the same as Fall Out Boy. Lamb of God could be considered a commercial metal band, but it, again, it's not the same as a commercial pop punk band. So what commercial is, is different. You know, it's subjective and it's very specific to the genre. But I would like to say that we focus on helping you do your very best work regardless of what genre you're trying to go into. What is the most difficult thing to understand about mixing metal on a pro level? I think that the thing that people get the most wrong at the very beginning is just acceptance of how long it's going to take. Uh, it's it's going to take years, maybe a decade, to get pretty good to where other people agree that your work is good. And at the beginning, you're going to suck. You're just going to be terrible. And you have to be okay with being terrible and you have to be patient with it. And I think that a lot of people have a hard time with the patience. They want the results very, very fast. They've been mixing for a few months and they hear their mixes compared to someone who's been mixing for years. It's definitely not as good. And that makes them very discouraged. So they don't try as hard. And that's where they go wrong because the only thing you should be comparing to is yourself and how you were a month ago, a year ago, six months ago, 
that you should be comparing your own progress against yourself. Are you getting better? Yes. Then keep going. And are you as good as this other person you're comparing yourself to? Maybe not. But did that person get that good within three months or six months or a year? No, they've been doing it for like 15 years or 20 years or 30 years. So a little bit of patience goes a really, really long way, I think. So basically, if you want to get really, really great at it, you want to get to a pro level with it. Basically, you just got to get settled in for the long haul and accept that this is a super, this is a, you know, a super marathon, basically. It's multiple marathons for a long, long time. And uh, you can't let, you can't let temporary, I guess, disappointments discourage you so much that you're going to stop working at it. How to understand that you started making good mixes? That's tough because, you know, if you listen to the URM podcast or the Riff Hard podcast, you'll see that even the very best in the world don't think that they're the very best in the world. You know, they get depressed about their own work. They question their own work and that never stops. So you have to kind of accept that you're never going to be satisfied with your work. And honestly, that's a good thing because if you're satisfied with your work, you're not going to keep on trying, right? If you're satisfied with your work, you can become complacent and lazy. So it's actually a good thing that you're never going to be fully satisfied with your work. You have to always keep trying. You have to always be looking for the weak spots, you know, and that's why it's important because you always have to be thinking about what can I do better? You know, if you're thinking about what can I do better, what's not good enough, consistently and acting on it for a long period of time, you're going to get a lot better. And then other people will start responding to your mixes. And uh, I think that that's the measure right there. Like you can never know. You'll never actually know. You don't have a good perspective on your own work. You can just keep on trying to get better, identifying weaknesses and try to get better. Pay attention to what people say they like, figure out how you did that work that into your style and then just keep on trying to get better and fixing those weaknesses, getting better with your strengths. But really, you're never going to be able to accurately hear your own work until a lot of time has passed. You know, maybe two years from now, you'll be able to hear a mix you did and, a, you know, a mix you did two years ago and judge it a little bit more objectively. But still, you're so in your own head and you're so close to it that you're never going to have good perspective. So I think the way that you know is by other people's reactions. And even then, I wouldn't take it too seriously uh, because you don't want to believe them too much. Like if everybody's praising your work and you believe them and that makes you think you don't need to try anymore, well, that's very bad too. So, you know, this idea of knowing that you're good or knowing, I, I don't know exactly if you ever fully get there, and I also don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. But what you do want to get to is a place where other people consistently like your work enough to ask you to do that work for them. And when you're getting that, that's a good sign. It doesn't mean that you've arrived at good, but it arri means that you've arrived to a point where some people like your work enough to pay for it. And then you should, you know, ex you know, be happy about that, appreciate it, but uh, keep keep trying. How do you choose the right sound engineer to work with for recording, mixing, and mastering songs for DAF? So to clarify, Jens Bogren mixed the new album, which we just finished. He also recorded the drums on most of it. And why did we pick him? Well, because of his prior work. And that's the same reason that anybody goes to any engineer if, they're, if they can afford it. You know, lots of times people can't afford to go to who they want to. So they'll settle for, you know, plan B or plan C. And I had plan B and plan C and plan D planned out uh, in case, you know, Jens was not available or out of budget. But it just so happened that he was available and we could afford him. And it's all based on prior work. And that's also, you know, kind of back to one of the mistakes that 
producers make or mixers make that I've noticed. I've noticed that they rely too much or they think they need to rely too much on advertisement when in reality, the thing that gets you work is other stuff that you've done. People need to hear what you've done and uh, really like it enough to inquire into working with you. You know, that brings up a conundrum if you don't have a body of work, but URM does solve that by giving you this thing we call portfolio builder. Anyhow, not trying to go off on a tangent. It was based on Jens's prior work. So, you know, if you just listen to his discography, he is really, really great at mixing metal that has lots of things going on and that is non-traditional. Like if you listen to Opeth or Demu Borgir, you know, or Septic Flesh, you know, Amorphous, I could just go down the list, you know, Leprous, like you just go down his discography. He's really great at working with bands that don't just do the traditional thing. And they have a lot of elements that are very difficult to mix into a metal mix. And he not only knows how to balance it correctly, but he knows how to do it with class. He understands vibe. He's just great. I mean, he's just great. And I know from experience that not everyone who's a great mixer is great at this type of metal. So, you know, some people are really, really great at types of metal where there's less going on. There's really good at making the standard arrangements sound huge and they're still great. It's not a value judgment. It's just a, you know, it's a style thing. And I think that with Jens, he has the knowledge and the ability to do justice to the level of arrangement complexity that Doth has. What do you use for your guitar tone for Doth songs? Lots of things. Um, this time around live, we're going to be using quad cortexes. In the studio, we use a number of things. I mean, you know, with in the studio, it, it's kind of an anything goes thing. We use the quad cortex for tracking I know that Jens reamped the rhythms, I believe, with a uh, 5150 and a dual rec, if I remember correctly, for two of the rhythms. And then two of the rhythms were one of his Bogren amp sims. And when we had guitars five and six, uh, I think it was another amp sim. But, you know, we'll use anything, anything and everything. Like, we, we don't care as long as it gets the gets the point across but live we're going to be using quad cortexes how people should take urm courses and live streams so they can become good at mixing metal you have to be obsessed with it so you have to like i can't tell you how to be obsessed with it and i can't tell anybody but i can tell you that you do have to be obsessed with it and if you're obsessed with it what you're asking me right now isn't even something that someone would ask. I mean, it's kind of obvious. If you're obsessed with learning a mix metal, this library of all these great mixers and professional bands where you can see how they did it, why wouldn't you do your homework on every single piece of it that you possibly can? Like, there's any, if you're actually obsessed with it, then the answer is do it all. Do every single possible thing you can do to get better. Don't worry about things like mix polls or competitions or things like that. That's not real life. That's that's not real life. That's uh that's a competition that is very much confined to a limited community. That's not the wider world. You should be focusing on your own skill level and be obsessed with it. If you're not obsessed with it, you're going to have a real hard time getting great because there are other people who are obsessed with it, who live, breathe, bleed it, that like it's their whole life. And the more you can make it your whole life, the better. And then if you do make it your whole life, well, then the question answers itself, right? Should I learn this thing? Well, of course you should. Why wouldn't you? Like, how, how good do you want to get? Do you want to be world-class? Then why would you not learn this thing from this world-class mixer? 
It's the, the question answers itself. The answer is you have to be obsessed. And my final question is when it comes to mixed feedback, what kind of a feedback should you take to make better mixes? We have our community manager named Joe Scaletta who does a lot of one-on-one -on -one feedback sessions. And then we also have this group called the Rocktagon, which people post their mixes and get feedback from each other. And what I would say is you have to trust the source of the feedback. That's it. And also interpret the feedback. So say that you're a mixer and you are mixing something for a bunch of non-mixers, which is going to often be the case. And they give you feedback that's not technical. You know, they don't know how to describe what they're hearing in technical terms. So they're using things that kind of wouldn't make sense that you have to interpret. But just because they're not good mixers doesn't mean that their feedback is, uh, let's just say, invalid, right? So you have to trust that their opinion is valid. And then also, you have to trust the source. So in the Rocktagon, if you've heard somebody's mixes and they suck and they're giving you very detailed technical advice, well, then maybe don't trust that. But if you hear their mixes and they suck, but they're giving you feedback that is more generalized, like eh, something doesn't sound right, like snares too loud or sounds sound, it's painful to listen, you know, more general things where they're not telling you exactly what to do but they're just telling you what their opinion is of it, you know, that's something to pay attention to. So it's how you interpret it. If someone super awesome at mixing gives you technical advice, well, you can trust that source, right? So it's a matter of weighing trust versus interpreting opinion. And just because someone's not good at mixing doesn't mean that their opinion isn't valid. So you have to separate the advice from the opinion and the feedback and, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Thank you so much, Yael, for such a wonderful interview. Thank you so much for taking your time. It was a huge pleasure talking to you. My pleasure, man. Thank you very much.